Welcome to Tigers SRD here on SportsRadioDetroit.com. Roger Steele, it's time Chris Brown, and tonight we have a special guest coming in for you, and uh, we'll be talking Tigers draft, and before I get the guests, I just wanted to kind of give a rundown. We're talking Tigers draft strategy, going over the postseason a little bit, and the Dodgers proving me wrong and proving Chris correct. We'll get to that a little bit as well. So join us on the podcast is Brian Sakowski from theperfectgame.com. You can find him at that website. And or excuse me, perfectgame.org, pardon me. And uh, Brian, we, we caught you in just a, just traveling. How many travel or how many uh, traveler my, or how many miles do you have? Frequent file miles do you have right now? Uh let's see. Delta like two hundred and fifty thousand. Oh. Um something yeah, I don't it's something ridiculous. I, I stopped looking at it because it was kind of depressing at one point. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope that there's a vacation coming in November, I would assume. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once we once we finish up with the, the WWBA World Championship, known in the industry as Jupiter, which is where it takes yeah. place down in Florida. Um, once we finish up with that, then we'll have some downtime, and I'll be able to relax a little bit. Yes, with the website announcing, too, they're going to Europe and Canada. I'm just wondering if those miles are going to increase for you at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, as, much, as much fun as I would have, like, going to try and find a kid and, you know, Italy for a whole month or something like something awesome like that. I, I don't know. I know we're, we're, we're expanding our, our PGBA out into Canada and into Europe. And that's kind of our, um, affiliated affiliations as far as running events. So that's more on the operation side. So, so right in the immediate future, I don't think they'll, they'll be sending me over there. Uh, um, but if they were to go over, if, if PG PGBA is to go over there and really, uh, Make an impact and, and find a niche in certain areas, and to the place to the point where we're we're holding international type of tournaments over there or something like that in in the, in the distant future. Then uh, maybe we'll see what happens. But but right now, I think I'll be uh, sticking in the lower forty eight. <laughs> have to have to go from national scouting director to international scouting director. <laughs> yeah, I, it would definitely do wonders for my delta miles. Uh, that's for <laughs> sure. <laughs> So do they ever send you like the DR or anything? Uh, we do. We do an event every year in Puerto Rico, um, which will not be happening this year because yeah, of unfortunately the fact that Puerto Rico has other things to worry about, um, to put it lightly. Uh, but yes, no, uh, that's really the most international we go right now, and that's really not even international. Is, is yeah. Puerto Rico? There have been you know scuttlebutt over the years of. of holding events in different places and, and trying to grow the brand and, and, you know, expose kids to higher level baseball in different places. But, but as of right now, no, just strictly United States and PR. Yeah. yeah one day it would be nice to even go into Cuba. Uh, that's where yeah. yeah. Cuba is, I mean, from, I've been there a couple times and, uh, just, it's a, it's the schooling and what have you for these baseball players is grooming is, is still, I mean, it's, it's antiquated and ancient as it is, it still works down there, and they're producing top talent all the time. So speaking of top talent, we look at the top 10 overall prospects for the MLB draft, and the Tigers have the first pick, and a lot of people are kind of either bittersweet about it, but some people I think are coming around to it more so than not to have the first pick. But the the, the one that, I, that I, I think I've championed a little bit, and I've talked about this in the last podcast, is the Tigers need a little bit of everything, it seems like. So... Brian, what stands out to you in terms of these top ten? You look at look at Kumar Rocker, the right hander out front of Georgia. There's Casey Mize, the because the Tigers team that go with power right hander, so this is why I'm kind of preferencing that. But the one I like a lot is uh, Nander D. Sayas, the shortstop, who is the same academy where uh, Lenore Francisco. Um, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Lador. Lador, thank you, Lador. Um, came from so that's who i like a lot but the tigers seem just the, the tigers seem to have the same typical mo is that going to change at all in, in this draft well i think it's i think if you're talking about the tigers in the top five picks or the top 10 picks or whatever then, then no you can look at history and draft strategy and then all those things and, and you can come to a come to an idea of what they may or may not do but with the first overall pick it, it completely changes the the outlook of everything because you literally have your choice you can have whoever you want or you can go with the what teams have been doing in recent years and that's maybe not taking number one on the board but taking number three or four and saving yourself some money against the pool 
and in the hopes of getting another top 20 player with the second pick or something like that for the sake of trying to build up the farm system that way. Because really, the, the best player in the class, as, as people like me have lined it up, hasn't gone 1-1 in the past few years. He's gone you know, two or three or four or what, whatever it was. Like last year, we had Hunter Green number one overall, and he went second. The, the Twins took Royce Lewis, who we had in the top three, but they saved a little bit more money on Royce Lewis than they would have with Hunter Green, and that allowed them to later on in the draft take guys like Landon Leach and so on and so forth. Uh, Brent Rooker out of Mississippi State, I'm sure they've used some of that money they saved to sign him. But it's uh, so it's, it's, an, it's a compelling type of argument to make whether – do you want the best player in the class or do you want the, the third and the 17th best players in the class, depending on how you line it up? And that's not even – we're eight months from the draft, so we don't know. There, there still might be a, a guy who emerges as the no-doubt, clear-cut, 1-1, Steven Strasburg, Bryce Harper, however you want to compare it, type of guy that, that may force the Tigers' hand. They might just have to take that guy. But we don't know that yet. That's, we're sitting here in October. Um, so that's what we're going to spend the next eight months trying to find is if there is that guy. Yeah, that was one of the reasons I, I wanted to talk to you just to get, to get the sort of groundwork for, cause it's going to be, it's probably going to be the main topic of conversation around the Tigers for the next, uh, year or so, because there's not going to be a whole lot else to talk about. Uh, so just to get some of the early names out there. And I was looking at the PG uh, top 10 and, and obviously anything, uh, you know, it, it's really early, but I did notice the conspicuous absence of Brady Singer in the top ten, which uh, a lot of other people seem to think that he's the, the you know the top uh, guy right now. So I was kind of curious uh, what uh, what the thinking was there. I can't even tell you how many questions I've answered about Brady Singer since this yeah. list came out, <laughs> and like I, and it was something I knew going in doing the list, and when we had our internal conversations about it, and I had a rough draft and sent it around for thoughts and, and had discussions with the rest of our scouting staff. And then in addition to talking to scouts from, I would think pretty close to every team and, and cross checkers and so on and so forth. But I made it a point to keep Brady Singer lower on my list than the rest of the publication industry had him because mm-hmm. I saw Brady Singer throw twice last year And I didn't come away with the impression of a 1-1 guy. I saw Brady Singer absolutely dominate college hitters with one pitch. Mm -hmm. I didn't see an average breaking ball. I didn't see an average changeup. I saw him throw 91, 95 bowling balls with 70 sink. And hitters did not have an answer for it at the college level. And that's fine. If he can dominate with that pitch, why would you screw around and throw a breaking ball? I don't blame him. I don't blame Kevin O'Sullivan at Florida for calling 90% fastballs when you, when you have that kind of weapon. However, for me to put a guy 1-1 and try and project him as into an ace role in the major leagues, I need to see an average breaking ball at least. I need to see an average second pitch at least, and I didn't with Singer. Now, that's not to say that he hasn't spent all summer and fall and winter moving into next spring developing a slider that's going to be a plus hammer that can, makes me look like a moron when he comes out in February. And if that's the case, then I will be more than happy to admit I was low, I was light, and we'll bump him way up. That's fine. That happens all the time in this world. And the vice versa happens. We're high on guys that we end up having to bump down in the spring. But for me right now, I just I didn't see a 1-1 caliber type of guy. And I've spoken to many scouts in the industry who agree with me. Our scouting staff agreed with me. So... Uh, for now, we'll be the uh, we'll be the the supposed low man on on Brady Singer, and that's we have, we still have him twelfth overall on the list. Like we still yeah. think he's a top half of the first rounder. Um, that's not to say we don't think he's good. I just told you, I think he's really good. But uh, yeah, so so I I kept him a little bit lower, um, not necessarily to prove a point or anything like that, but but it was a conscious decision. No, and I really like that because since as much as I can, you know. I read all the stuff I can, and I look, and I know these names, but I haven't seen these kids outside of maybe, uh, you know, with Singer, maybe a little bit in the College World Series, and, and with a lot of these high school kids only in the, uh, you know, the perfect game or the Under Armour stuff. And then you've been out there and you've seen all these kids. I was mentioned before the show about all your YouTube videos, which people should check out if uh, if you're interested in this. You've, you've got videos for just about every guy uh, <laughs> who, who might who might go in the top ten. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it seems like uh, so. So you have 
Ethan Hankins, number one on the list, which isn't terribly shocking. I mean, he's he's the name that sort of he was up there with Rocker for a while, and it seems like he rose to the top recently. But I'm kind of curious where you would rank him among the the prep righties over the last few years. Is he as good or better than Hunter Green? Do you think? Uh, it's interesting because Hankins is Hankins is a PO all the way. He's a pitcher only. Like he's not. Whereas Hunter Green was. Mm-hmm. As legit a yeah. two-way guy as you could talk about, with the exception of Brendan McKay, obviously last year. Um, but Hunter Green, for for as talented as he was, he never fully was a pitcher. He never was spending a hundred percent of his time developing as a pitcher. Um, with that being said, they're they're kind of different profiles. Um, Green was obviously more the more athletic of the two. I would think that Hankins has a little bit more projection in him, um, but it, it, it is similar ease of operation on the mound. There, there's similar ease to the mechanical profile. There, there's both, you know, this guy's going to be a starter, we think. Um, and it, it's kind of, it's actually kind of similar. Um, it's both big time velocity with easy arm actions. Hankins has better fastball life. So I guess you could say the quality of the fastball is a little better. Whereas uh, I thought Hunter Green had right at this point in their developments had just a little bit better command. Um, but that could also be a product of the fact that Hankins' fastball moves 18 inches sometimes, so that's hard to control. Uh, as I mean, I'm sure the, everybody's seen the popular clip of, of Hankins from the Team USA that the Pitching Ninja posted, uh, which is a great mm-hmm. follow, by the way. Everyone follow the Pitching Ninja. Absolutely. Uh, and where it's, you know, the catcher is set up in, and Hankins throws a fastball in, but it, then it moves two feet. It just takes off. And the you know the catcher who I believe it was Anthony Sigler who's who's one of the the top prep players in the country just just missed it it just missed it like Hankins didn't miss a spot it just moved two feet like so I mean just that one clip is is kind of uh, indicative of the fact that you can see oh and it was ninety five too like ninety five or ninety six it wasn't you know an eighty eight mile an hour sinker but um, Green always had a better breaking ball. It was a, like a harder slider, but he always had better feel for it than Hankins up until this past year, where Hankins' mm-hmm. breaking ball moved like two full grades up. Oh, wow. Uh, it, was, it came into the summer, and all through his development, it was kind of a like a loopier, trying to throw it from a low three-quarter curveball type of thing that pretty much everybody and their uncle said, okay, he's going to have to throw a slider eventually. It's just you can't throw a curveball from that arm slot. It's, it's hard to. Um, I mean, Max Scherzer does it, but you know, it's harder mm-hmm. to, it's just the, the baseline of it. But then, you know, ever so slightly, Ethan Hankins rose his arm slot a little bit. He went up to more of a traditional three quarter, you know, not so much the lower slinger. And all of a sudden his curveball went from like a 35 to a 55, like overnight. Wow. Um, and you know, it'll show you a six. I mean, if you look at the, his clips from perfect game, all American game, there's a couple of sixes in there. Um, and that kind of is what pushed him from in the top 10 to, yeah, that guy's number one. Uh, it was simply put the development of his breaking ball. He's always thrown a lot of strikes. He's always been super projectable and easy and, and all that. And he's got a decent change up too. So I, I think that there's some recency bias right now mm-hmm. with saying that Hankins might be a little bit better than, than Green. But, I, I mean, I just think that, that they're both superstar potential type of guys at the top of the respective classes. And it's hard for me to separate them. So I, I wouldn't be, I don't think it'd be fair for me to say Hankins is better. Cause I think there is some recency bias there having seen him far more recently than I've seen green. Um, I think green might end up throwing 107. Uh, so. <laughs> I heard he was, he was sitting 98 to 101 and in instructs for three innings. So <laughs> that's not still surprising at all. <laughs> so that's probably, yeah. So, so the one thing that, that, draft people always like to mention is that no high school right hander has ever been taken one one uh and i guess on, on one hand it would be sort of fitting if the tigers were to be the team to do it but on the other hand it, everything i've heard about this draft is that it's incredibly deep with uh high school arms so i guess it, like it, in my head an ideal scenario for the tigers would be to get that one sort of impact bat mm-hmm. in the top pick and, and and do that thing where you know you he might not be the, you know, if it's a Terang or a DeSantis or a Kellenic, who I want you to talk about in a little bit, uh, get a guy like that, save a little bit of money, and, and target another high school pitcher in the second round. Um, 
so yeah, I'm kind of just kind of curious about uh, some of these position players. What what you've seen from them? What you think uh, they can or can't do in the next year to to move up to be worthy of that number one spot? I mean, I'm a big fan of Jared Kelenic. I, I think if you made me do a mock draft tomorrow, I would probably have him going to the Tigers in one. Um, obviously, I, I put him at number two on the list. We're all huge fans of his at Perfect Game. I think the entire industry is a big fan of his. I think I saw one list that had him in the 30s or something a couple of weeks ago, and I like fell out of my chair. But <laughs> no, Jared Kalanick is extremely talented. He is like the ultimate competitor, which is what people you know who aren't around these kids a lot, you know, outside of the scouts who are signing them and, and dealing with the makeup. Yeah. But a lot of these guys don't get to know these guys, these players. And I, you know, I'm not Jared Kalanick's BFF, but but I've talked to him a few times, and. Just the ultimate, like, intense competitor. Like, I will be better than you. Like, that's got that Brigman in him. Yes. Like, you know, it's, it's a national cross checker was telling me a story about Jared Kalanick a while back. And he was just saying, like, if you just play a game of go fish with this guy and you beat him, like, he will make it his life's mission to play you again and beat you. And it's like, that is the dude I want 1 1. Like, mm-hmm. I want that alpha male, like, no, 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 no. I'm the best, and I will prove it to you, and I will work harder than you. Like, I want that guy. And, and unfortunately, and the way it seems and it's portrayed by the media, that guy is always the dude who has no tools. Like, that oh, guy's no. always, like, the 5'8", like, white second baseman, senior. <laughs> like just, se- just a picture of Pedroia. <laughs> like, yeah, like, the, the said, senior yeah. from, like, Long Beach community or whatever that like he got drafted in the 26th round and you know what that guy's going to get a cup of coffee like that type and that's a great story like i love those guys but now we're talking about a guy who has that same mentality but with like supreme tools and all of a sudden if you put that together like the popular comp floating around for kalanick is grady sizemore obviously a healthy grady sizemore and if we remember pre-injury grady sizemore was like a seven like, Grady was Sizemore legit. was really, really good. <laughs> like, I remember the popular talk, like, Grady Sizemore, who's better, Grady Sizemore or Austin Jackson? Like, it wasn't even close. Like, you know, I, I have a lot of love for Austin Jackson when he was in his prime here in Detroit. But come on, it's not even close, man. So so we're, when we talk about Kalanick, you talk about a guy who has all the tools. He, he's a plus runner who can play center field right now. And, and there's some people who think he might have to be a right fielder long-term as he continues to, to get more physical, but he's a center fielder for sure. Right now, um, lots of arm strength there. He was like 96 from PG national or something like that from the outfield. I'd have to check back, but uh, good runner, lots of raw power from left side of plate moves the barrel around the zone. You know, guys have no problem saying that he'll hit. Um, so, so he's a guy that, you know, the competitiveness and the makeup make me think that he's a little bit safer as far as high school bats goes, but there really aren't mm-hmm. any safe high school bats. So, like, that doesn't exist. Um, so, yeah. obviously, with anybody, you're going to take a risk, but if you take Kalanick 1 1, I, I don't, especially if you want a bat, um, yeah, he'd be the best one in the class for me right now. Yeah, and it does seem like you might be able to save a little bit of money there, though it's always a tough with, uh, with high school kids, you know, if they've got. Uh college commitments or whatever but then again he may be one of those guys who just wants to prove everybody wrong immediately right um so yeah what about the the shortstops uh terang is he gonna is he gonna hit and hit for power and to say this can he stick there um both have some questions to the profiles both are extremely uber talented like you know really good obviously really good baseball players but but with terang there's some questions about whether he has the arm strength to stay at shortstop long term um, he's actually pretty similar to Mickey Moniak a few years ago. Mm. Uh, rather, Mickey Moniak was a center fielder the whole way. But if you think of that profile and put it at shortstop, it's it's actually pretty similar to what Terang is. Um, like a really good left-handed hitter who can really you know manipulate the barrel. He can really put bat to ball. He makes contact everywhere. He's kind of a spray guy right now with some extra base pop. Uh, this fall in scout ball, we, we've heard that he's he's shown a little bit more pull juice, like really kind of getting the barrel out and, and trying to hit for power to the pull side, and it's working for him. Um, but, you know, the actions defensively, no problem, middle infielder. It's just if the arm isn't quite what you want, then you're looking at either second base or center field. And at that point, 
I don't know about the value match at one one, but he's he's got the sim the similar profile to Moniac and that guys are have no problem projecting plus hit tools. You're not sure how much how much game power is going to be there. Like it might max out his average, but if that's a guy playing shortstop, yes, I'll no question, that. have him in the have him in the conversation for one one. If that's a guy playing second base, I don't know. Mm. You know, if that's a guy playing center field and you think he can be an impact guy out there, sure, let's talk about it. But so it's going to come down to, to where guys project him to play long term defensively, basically with him. Now, DeSantis is the more physical of the two, um, and he's switch hitter with lots of raw power from both sides. It's very raw. Uh, not to say it's not talented; it's obviously super talented. But it's it's very raw. He's kind of a free swinger in terms of approach right now, um, which you know most high school hitters are anyway. But yes, and the questions about him at shortstop are, are, are is he going to get too big? Like, does he have the twitch to really play there? So, so there's some folks who think he's probably a third baseman long term. But, you know, it, it's tough to say. Like, with scouts at this time of year, when we talk to them about players projecting, the, projecting them to positions long term, they're all pessimistic. Like, mm-hmm. to a T, everyone is a pessimist. Like, and Drelton Simmons could suit up for Montverde Academy in January and play short, and guys would be like, ah. Future first base. Yeah. I don't, maybe, maybe he can stick it short. You know, like, I, seriously, like, I, Kevin Kiermeyer could play center field for mo- the high school team I coach in, the, in March, and guys would be like, ah. I don't know, man. Like, ah, probably a left fielder. Probably left fielder. I like him, <laughs> but it's probably. So it's. You have to kind yeah. of take that with a grain of salt a little bit. But, um, yeah, both have some questions to their profile, but both, obviously, they're in our top ten. Both are super talented. Both were perfect game All-Americans. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I imagine that the scariest thing as a scout is is putting plus grades on guys. <laughs> like, ugh, I don't know. How about just average across the board? Yeah, a lot of guys, a lot of guys fall into that rut of, like, they don't use the whole scale. And yeah. it's kind of infuriating, and I think it's even more. I'm sure it's more infuriating if you're like a scouting director who's employing these guys. Mm-hmm. But like every report that I get or read or or, or I have you know the access to, it's like, eh, 45. Ah, I really like him, 55. Like, <laughs> use the whole scale, yeah. man. Tell me if he's bad. Tell me if he's good. Like, I, you know, it's not going to hurt my feelings. Like, I'm not going to fire you. <laughs> yeah. Is it re- is it a reputation thing at that point? Then is it just be you know if the one guy bad against the record kind of thing, or is that how it works? Yeah, yeah. I think it's just guys are afraid to rock the boat. Um, they don't want to. They don't want to send in a report that has a seven on it and get a call from their cross checker saying, "Are you sure?" Um, so it's it's just easier to kind of sit on the fence a little bit in that regard. Yeah, I might just say the nature of a really inexact science. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking of which, uh, now I'm just going to ask you to guess. Uh, so I'm just kind of curious uh, if you could name a, one or two guys who, uh, and I think you mentioned it earlier, you know, you don't, never know when these guys pop up. I think, what was it, Mackenzie Gore was, wasn't was really in the top ten conversation a year right. before the draft, and then you know, finished up, you know, went in third. Uh, so I'm curious if there's, if there's somebody down the list right now you think might shoot up into the top five, top ten. I think Mike Vassell has a chance. Um, right-handed pitcher, high school kid from Massachusetts. Um, like, I, I think he's got a chance to go to jump up, but it's going to be hard considering he's going to be throwing in March in Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. So, like, it's going to be 17 degrees. You know, it's hard for these Northeast guys. Uh, obviously, we did, we saw it wasn't really a problem with Ian Anderson a couple of years ago, but that's just how it is. Um, but he's he's a physical righty who I've seen 93, 96, and no one sees it. Like, he's one of those guys who has the invisible. Like, he mm-hmm. hides it really well. It just explodes. Um, he likes to pitch at the top of the zone. I'm sure if we check, you know, I haven't seen TrackMan data, but I'm sure if we check TrackMan data on him, he'd have a high fastball spin rate. I'm sure it's got some of that rise to it. Um, and I've seen him throw an average curveball for strikes, and he's got a good changeup, too. So I think he's a guy that if scouts see him on the right day and he's tightened up the breaking ball a little bit and he's still throwing strikes, then I think he's a guy who could jump up a good bit. Uh, I liked him quite a bit this summer. We made him an all American and he dominated that game too. Um, I think that a guy that I'm higher on than the industry seems to be is Steven Gingery or Gingery. I I don't want to offend him. Gingery, uh, (laughs) left-hander from Texas tech, 
that you know I've gotten good reports on. It's it's like you know an above average fastball, but it's a really really good changeup. Guys think he'll throw a little bit harder, so you could end up having a plus fastball plus changeup combination with a decent breaking ball. And being a college guy, he's automatically going to have more of the benefit of the doubt than these high school guys will. So I think you could see him go a little bit higher than where we have him. But that's kind of the nature of the beast in, in projecting like, oh, which of these guys that you think is the second rounder could go top five? Yeah. So you, I'm like, uh, you know, Blaine Knight would be another one from Arkansas. We've been high on him. He was mm-hmm. a draft eligible sophomore last year. We had him yeah, pretty I high his up. Name from last year. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We had him pretty high up on a list. He ended up, you know, not signing, went back to Texas Tech. Uh, lots of good reports coming in on him, as there have been for over a year now. Um, I think Mike Ciani, if, if guys really believe in the bat, he was kind of the hero of, of Team USA's run to a gold medal for the, the 18U junior games or whatever the, the official title is. But he's a toolsy left-handed hitter from the Northeast. Guys from the Northeast always tend to get a little bit more of the benefit of the doubt because scouts go in and say, well, it's 12 degrees and snowing. He's probably better than he looks. You know, that that type of thing. Um, but, yeah, those are just some names. Lenny Torres is – he's going to be like 17 in three months on draft day. It's like something super, super young. So I always like that. Yeah, I think I think a guy like him, even if he's still valued in the second round, could go in the first round for a team that essentially really values age. Um, I know, you know, there's several teams who, who – they won't take a high school kid if he's 19 years old. Like he won't be on their board yeah. on draft day, and they put a higher premium on the kids who are still 17. Uh, that's just how the model works out for them. So I think a guy like that could potentially pop up a little bit. And I'm a big fan of Nick Schnell, uh, left-handed hitting in outfielder from Indianapolis, uh, prep kid. I, I think that you know if I had had my way, and this was a I had carte blanche over this list, he'd be a good bit higher, but. As as it is, it's a it's a collaborative effort between the the scouting staff at Perfect Game, along with the executive board at Perfect Game, along with inputs from team scouts. So he's down a little bit, but but I'm a big fan of his. I think he can hit. And I think there's going to be a lot of power that comes to. But yeah, I mean, those are some names. There's going to be more. I'll do another update to this list in, in about a month that I'm sure we'll uh, have another round of discussions about. But. It's a, it's an ever evolving fluid type of deal that I've already changed three times since I published it. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and then the other guess, which is this is uh, just throwing darts at a board, I think, is is if the Tigers do do that, you know, the two for one sort of thing. Who, is there is there a guy you could see, sort of, uh, would be a target for them at like the thirty what a thirty fifth or thirty seventh pick or whatever, where where you know maybe he's a high school kid who's got a solid commitment and it's going to take some more money and he wants a top 10 bonus, but, uh, might not be worth it. Um, I would keep an eye on Carter Stewart in that spin kid. Yeah. Oh my God. And it coach, it matches the eye test. (laughs) Like there's, there's several times where I've heard, you know, over the last couple of years, especially since we installed TrackMan at, at our facility in Georgia and, and all the fields we use in Florida, that so we're, we obviously we have access to, to this to these metrics mm-hmm. now. So there's lots of times where I hear a college coach say, "Yeah, but his spin rate's like above average," and I'm looking and I'm like, "Dude, that is a 30 curveball. I don't care how much it spins. Like that's not a good fit." <laughs> Or and vice versa. There'll be times where I'm like, "Man, that's a pretty good pitch, and it's below average spin or something like mm-hmm. that." And but Carter Stewart, that curveball that sets records for spin absolutely matches the eye test. Oh, my goodness. Is that thing a hammer? Like, I, it was a year ago, like just a year ago now, where I saw him pitching in one of our underclass events. Had never heard the name before. Um, it was just skinny beanpole of a kid out there slinging 88. And then, like, he let loose this hellacious breaking ball. And me and... and one of the guys that at the time worked worked with Perfect Game, worked with me, who's now a, a member of a major league team, um, we looked at each other and went, oh, like, you all see that? Like, that's that's how it's – that's good. Like, you guys got that? Yeah, no, okay, good. You, all see, you, you guys should – throw it again, Carter. Can you do that again for us? And then he lets off another one, and we're like, yep, that's – I want that one. That one was good. And then fast forward a year, and he pitches in the All-American game, and it was just – I'm sure – most people saw that 
just uh, his performance in the All-American game, just throwing curveballs at 47 feet and guys are swinging over the top of them. <laughs> it's pretty special. It's pretty special. Well, yeah, and again, you've got you've got video of him on your uh, YouTube page. If people yep. want to go look at, at Carter Stewart. Um, so, yeah, I guess in the only other uh, speculative thing, I guess I'm asking you to speculate a lot, but that's because we've got you here and it's a good resource. Do. That's what we do. Um, and, and, yeah, and, and, and with PG, we were talking before that, that you're going out there seeing kids who are freshmen and sophomores or possibly even younger. So uh, as depressing as it is to say, the Tigers are probably picking – top five again in 2019 possibly number one again so is there is there a name for one of these you know underclassmen that that's standing out already uh well number one in the class for us in 2019 is, is bobby witt jr uh yeah. wow son, son, son of, the, of uh, bobby uh, witt yeah the ranger <laughs> the ex-ranger yeah yes yes he is uh, he's number one in the class for us he's been there for for quite some time um just a you know, extremely, extremely talented baseball player. I think we'd be talking about him in the first round if he was eligible for 18. Uh, like, all the tools are there. He's a, he's a right-handed hitting shortstop with solid size, um, lots of arm strength, super advanced actions and athleticism, plus runner. Might be better than a plus runner, actually. I'll see him in Jupiter. I'll let you guys know. Um, you know, lots of bat the ball. He played at the same high school as... Alex Scherf went to, who was a, a draft guy from this most recent draft. He went in the third round, uh, perfect game All-American. And I had talked to scouts who said that they saw Scherf, you know, two or three times in the spring, and they had their reports written and filed, and everything was, they did their due diligence, and it was done. But they went back to the school a fourth time just to watch Bobby Witt play, who was nice. a sophomore at the time. So, you know, we're talking about... You know, a guy with, with tremendous upside that guys have seen. He's been on the circuit for a couple of years now. He's played in all the older events. He's played in area codes. He's, he's done this and that as an underclassman just because of how talented he is. Um, so he's our number one from, from the high school ranks and, and from the college stuff. I, I think you'd be looking at maybe a guy like Nick Lodolo from TCU, uh, the left-handed pitcher who started a good bit for them as a freshman. Um, there, you know, there's several names. We're high on, on Braden Shoemake, the infielder from Texas A&M. There's mm -hmm. Luca Delatri, who, who should be uh, North Carolina's Friday starter this year as a sophomore. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff coming in on Ryan Zephyr, John, uh, right-handed oh, pitcher yeah. from Kansas, who we like a good bit. Drew Mendoza went to Florida State with a great deal of hype. He was picked by the Tigers in the 40th. Tigers drafted him, yeah. Yep, 40th round. Um, third baseman who can absolutely mash from the left side. There, there's a lot of names there. You know, Nick Quintana at Arizona, who, who had a monster freshman year as a third baseman there. Um, it's it's a little early for us to yeah. be, you know. But, I mean, I'll, we're going to we'll, – we'll come out with a draft list for 19 in January at some point. But it's uh, – those guys, no one's really bared down enough on them to see who is really separating. But we'll obviously have a much better idea in the spring. Um, but yeah, those are some names for nineteen right now. Well, th those are probably none of them are probably going to be there in a year because that's just <laughs> well, just yeah. I mean, I'm yeah. <laughs> not going to hold you to this. I mean, that, there was there was a, ca a catcher who was doing well on the Cape too, but I forget his name. But um, Langoliers. That sounds about yeah. I was like, is that from, uh, from is that Stephen King horror movie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> from Baylor, yes, yeah. He's made some noise. He's present at near the top of of the working list we have for twenty nineteen right now. Um, yeah, Cooper Johnson from Ole Miss is. We valued him in the in the late first type of round as a high school kid, um, just because of how incredible he is defensively. So even if he never hits, he's probably going to be a high draft pick out of college just because of how good that is back there. Um, but yeah, no, those are some names for you to to chew on for a year and a half. <laughs> Very nice. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Roger. I was going to ask the the. You look at a collegiate level, you look at the University of Michigan, which was top 25 last year, and they begin players drafted kind of in the later rounds, nothing first or second round. But the reason why I was asking is because I do follow Michigan baseball and I do follow some of the Big Ten. Is there any players that are in the Big Ten right now currently, or even you know even at Central Michigan, some of the schools locally, that are going to be any type of draft prospects? Yeah, I'm, there, there's quite a few draft prospects throughout the state. I don't know if we'd be talking about – like super high end top five round type of guys, but yes, I, Michigan has uh, Will Tribuker, a left handed pitcher who he's thrown quite a bit for them his first couple of years, strictly or mostly out of the bullpen. But obviously, they lost pretty much their whole rotation 
of a year ago uh, through the draft. So I believe they're going to be looking at him to, to start on the weekend for them. He had a really good summer in the Cape. The velocity was up. Uh, he's been up to 94, 95. Um, so, yeah, they're, they're excited about him. Uh, Central Michigan has a couple guys. I just saw them a few weeks ago uh, play the Canadian national team in Mount Pleasant um, to give you an idea of my my increased <laughs> levels of false hustle. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, yeah, CMU's got a few guys. Uh, Dazon Cole should be their closer, and he'll probably start in center field for them at some point too. But, you know, he's been up to 96, 97. It's super fast arm. I could see him being a priority reliever somewhere on day two. Um, Daniel Robinson is ultra toolsy left-handed hitting outfielder who has like a seven body and he's a plus runner who can really go get it in the outfield and he can really hit. Uh, there hasn't been a lot of power there yet, but if it comes along, you could be, he might end up being the first kid from the state of Michigan taken. Um, if power comes along with him, like that's just how toolsy and, and advanced he is. Um, just thinking out loud in the Big Ten, uh, Luke Schilling at Illinois throws the crap out of the ball. He's had some problems with command. He's actually a Michigan guy. He went to Notre Dame Prep in uh, Rochester, I think that is. Clarkston. Hmm. One of the two. Oakland County hmm. something or another. Yeah, it's like I think it's like on the border of like Pontiac, Waterford, or in that yes, area. Yeah, Pontiac. That's yeah. it. Pontiac, Notre Dame Prep. I played against them all the time in high school. You'd think I'd remember. Well, I went to I went to, <laughs> I went to uh, Cabrini, and uh, unfortunately— You what? I went to Cabrini. I went to GR, man. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. No. All right. Well, that's a yeah. Small Listen, world, we gotta man. hang up now, dude. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, look. I mean, to be to be fair, the C and D division, you know, part of my language ain't shit compared to the A and B. So, you know, I mean, it was out of out of it's just yeah. I mean, we we're playing, but this is when I went to high school. We we're playing like schools are no longer open. Benedictine, the Porus. Yeah. Yeah, so a lot of those program, you know, quote unquote programs, are long gone. But you go up against a school like Pontiac Notre Dame Prep, and you're, you know, they have guys that are just, I don't know. Richard had better. Fa- I'll just say this: Richard had better facilities, better jerseys. Cabrini's come a long way since I went there, but still, nevertheless, <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. from the schools you were talking about, I feel like you were a little before my time there. Yeah, Maybe I was. I was. Yeah, I'm talking like yeah the. The uh, Detroit to Port, uh, Saint Martin de Porres, Saint uh-huh. Agatha, Saint Alphonsus. Oh boy! Yeah, I mean, I went to, <laughs> I went around the time when Ryan Anderson, the second pick overall for Seattle Mariners, played for Devon Child, and I played oh, okay. him, and I played against them in elementary school because D, or they, he played for their A squad, and because DC right. had two teams in junior high, A squad and a B squad, yep. and their A squad, we played their A squad, got destroyed. Play their B squad and we hung in there. Okay, but we still lost. But never, nevertheless, that's when my era was. But uh, continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, man. I, that, that's just. I'm a little shook that I'm talking to somebody from Cabrini. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I made a, I made a promise I would never do that. But anyways, <laughs> you guys throw better parties. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> I have no yeah. idea what's going on. It's great. <laughs> just let us small time downriver Catholic yeah. leaguers stick to yeah. us. No. Okay, man. But... <laughs> Very good. Um, I uh, I yeah, went to man. high school with Drew Henson. <laughs> there you go. Oh well, okay, yeah. He, he was <laughs> I didn't good. play. He was all right. <laughs> actually, you know, my last year actually it was the uh, Aquinas was still around. So let's just put it to that one. Aqu- it was the because Paul Ostermacher went there. That was a big yep. claim. Really? Deal. Yeah, Paul Ostermacher went to Aquinas. Yeah. Don't be damned. Actually, grew up down the street from Aquinas. But, really? Uh, oh yeah. Yeah, that football field over there, that's where our home games were, that Southgate field for a while. And then we, for some strange reason, decided to have games at Taylor Center for an unknown reason. They had so. them at Allen Park High School when I was in high school. Yeah. Um, was... Yeah. <laughs> no, Richard, I mean, Richard's doing well, though. Their attendance was a little struggling for a while. But now, I've, from my last I heard, um, their, their football team crushed, uh, I believe they crushed us. So, yeah, they're doing yeah, and yeah, by man. the way, yeah, for the record, Chris, it's small. The Down River Catholics League or Down River Catholic schools are small, but we are a proud bunch. We are. No, there's, I, there's I guess. literally <laughs> two of them now. It's just yeah. GR and Cabrini. You know, now that um, what was what was the school in wind out the close? It had like three. Um, oh, Mount, Car- Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they always had a good. You know, it's interesting. They always had a good baseball team. Somehow they. I know. Took, I know. It, it blew my mind that, but a lot of those kids I knew played travel ball because. Even playing downriver, because I, I mean, I grew up in Dearborn Heights, but even in the travel circles there, that that team always had some two or three guys that just 
had a good curveball, and then we just couldn't do you know dick up against it. So, yeah, man, <laughs> this is surreal, man. We're this gonna have is to catch up offline. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're taking we're taking all these. Oh right, yeah, time. so yeah. Okay, go, go, continue on about <laughs> the Big Ten is uh, we're wrapping up here. But go ahead, what were you saying though? I'm sorry. I mean, there they have, there's a few guys from the Big Ten that are that's on my top 150. Uh, Robert Newstrom from Iowa, the physical corner outfielder who's got some power and. Uh, Ryan Feltner from Ohio State, who throws like 99. Um, the concern is th- that he's a reliever. He's got some command concerns. I saw him in the spring, and, and it wasn't exactly pretty in terms of strike throwing, but it's a super live arm. And um, let's see here, man. We got uh, Nick Dunn, the second baseman from Maryland on here. He should be a pretty good pick. He can absolutely bang, but there's some questions about where he's going to play long term. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the Big Ten should be should be solid again. I would. I think Indiana is going to be really, really good. Uh, just having some conversations with their coaching staff in the last couple of days, I think they're going to be really good. I think Michigan, Michigan will be good again. I think Michigan State will be good. Uh, Iowa is always good. Uh, Maryland is always pretty solid. I think Ohio State will bounce back a little bit this year. They had a rough year last year, but yeah, it should be a pretty good league, top to bottom. I don't. I don't think that there's anybody there who's going to jump into the first round. Um, but yeah, there should be plenty of, of day two guys coming from the Big Ten. Now you look at the teams that are in the postseason. And the reason why I'm switching gears: you look at the Dodgers, who are now heading to the NLCS. And the reason why I want to ask about draft strategy: with the, the Dodgers, and Chris and I have been admired with, and just just amazed how well they draft in their draft strategy and their scouting. What makes the Dodgers stand out so much? They're able to keep their prospects. And this is, a, this is an organization, Brian, that you look at since the 60s well, that has been produced a way where everybody talks about the Cardinal way and yada, yada, yada. And they, even the Cardinal way is being kind of being questioned these days. But the Dodgers have been consistent. They, they get they, – they draft late. They don't seem to – but they draft late, but they get the maximum value. What is – when you're talking to your cross-checkers and your scouts – what do the Dodgers do differently that stands out above everybody else? I think the Dodgers have pretty close to a perfect marriage between scouting and analytics. Um, and I think that that helps them significantly on the, the amateur side, on the drafting side. I think that they have, and I, I'm not privy to the details of, of what the, the algorithms and formulas and all that look like, but I think, I think that they have found the best way to use analytics in terms of uh, helping to determine value on the amateur side instead of just you know looking at high school stats and looking at college stats and doing what they do however they do it and then marrying those numbers with what their scouts see um, I think that they they do a really good job of finding guys who slip through the cracks of the of the major scouting industry I think they do a really good job of maximizing value from later round guys um, I think they do a really really fantastic job of, of finding major leaguers on day three of the draft. Um, and obviously that's where the analytics come into play a good bit because, and, and their area scouts, especially because, uh, you know, a lot of the times we're not, we're not getting guys taken in the 35th round that have been cross-checked. Um, cross-checkers only have so much time. So we're going by what the area scouts saw and you're going by what the analytics tell you. And you take that guy and all of a sudden he's, he's a solid four in the major leagues, which is tremendous value. Um, for for the draft position, obviously, but yes, I think they do a they do a really really good job marrying the analytics with the scouting, blending it all together at the highest level in terms of of who they're going to select and when and, and making the draft board and so on and so forth. So, whatever they found out, and and then to be fair, I, I think perhaps even more important is just how good their player development is. Yeah, um, they, they're big into the new, you know, the, they. They're fans of driveline. They don't turn away guys who use weighted balls. In fact, they embrace them. Um, they're big on the cutting edge of, of new, not necessarily new, but like kind of, um, I don't know the word here, newer age, I guess, hitting techniques. Uh, they want to bring in player development employees and coaches who, who are well-versed in these in these types of techniques and these types of training ideas. Uh, they're always on the cutting edge looking for the next best thing. They're not dinosaurs. They're not married to the belief of the thing that they thought that worked in 1965, like a lot of major league teams are. Um, they're very uh, individualized in their player development approach. They're very, every player is different. Um, 
in their approach to development, which is something that not very many major league teams are. The reality of it is a lot of these major league teams are very cookie cutter in their approach, and you can tell in the results at the end of the day. Uh, but yes, so no, I think the Dodgers, from a player development, from a from a scouting, from an analytics perspective, all when dealing with guys who aren't in the major leagues yet, who are trying to get there, are at the, if not at the top of the curve, very close to it. I have a lot of respect for Cleveland in the same way. Uh, but yes, very, very impressive the way the Dodgers do the things that they do. Yeah, when you just look at the teams that are in the playoffs, they, and you think about the scouting and development, you got the Cubs and the Dodgers and the Indians and the Red Sox and the Astros. These are all teams that have, you know, in the last few years, have, if, if not from before that, in the last few years have really gained a, a reputation for being on the cutting edge of this stuff. And so it bears fruit, I think. Absolutely. Especially the way the Indians, it seems like they they stretch their dollars quite a bit, and they've done a very good job on the international market. But they their their scouting approach is well done. And so, last question for you, Brian, before we get out of here this evening for the Tigers, in terms of the late round strategy, the late value picks, it seems like that recently the Tigers have not been able to get anywhere with that. But where do you, where do you stand on where the Tigers could be in terms of? They look like they like I said earlier in the podcast. They need a little bit of everything. They need pitching, they need in the infield prospects. But do you think the Tigers are going to? It just seems of like they're talking about the focus, the focus on analytics. But from from your, what you've seen or what you've heard, is there really a change going so far? Because a lot of people don't think on the surface the Tigers have changed too much yet. I mean, this is I know this is everybody has to practice patience with Al Avila, but. Seemingly, it doesn't seem like there's just a lot of information coming out of what they're doing because it's it just it doesn't. I don't know if the information there's information not being released or what have you, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of different uh, things coming out there about the, what the Tigers are going to be doing. Well, I don't. I couldn't really answer that from a player development perspective because I don't have the answers. But uh, from a draft perspective, it, I definitely thought that in the most recent draft they actually tried to draft for upside. Um, past the first pick, uh, all they took an all upside guy second in Ronaldo Rivera, like a pure boomer bust upside type of guy, which is far from the norm for the Tigers. In the years past, they would have taken a college reliever there, um, like a guy who probably ends up pitching in the major leagues but isn't an impact piece. But yeah, so so I, I definitely think that that they're trying and they have tried in the last year or so to look for an impact piece in, in the sixth round, even if it's, if it's a guy who's not going to pan out instead of taking that safe type of guy. Um, I, and I think that it's unfair to say, oh, high school versus college, because you have to look at the, the different kind of college players that there are. You know, there's college guy A who pitched for three years at TCU and was really good out of their bullpen for three years at TCU and is what he is, and that's pretty solid, and we're going to take that guy. Or there's upside college guy who maybe didn't perform to, to his tools and has upside remaining. And, you know, the numbers don't look all that great. And, and he, maybe he switched positions a couple times or something like that. And, and I think that, you know, that's kind of two different schools of thought if you're just looking at college prospects. And I think the Tigers actually tried to go more towards the upside in this past year, especially even taking college players in later rounds. Um, I, I think a guy like Dane Myers comes to mind, who they took in the, the sixth or seventh round, whatever that was. And, and he's a guy who I believe that, you know, he, he was a two-way player at Rice. He, he hit for them. He played third base. He uh, relieved for them. But the Tigers believe that they can turn him into a starter. Um, you know, he's an athletic kid with, with good components to his delivery and his overall mechanical profile. And uh, with a live arm, and, and the Tigers believe that they can turn that guy into a starter. And all of a sudden... If you're getting a starting pitcher in the seventh round that performs in the major league levels, even as a, like a number four guy, then guess what? You had a pretty good draft. Mm -hmm. uh, and in years past, that guy, they didn't take that guy. So, you know, they didn't take a guy who even would come close to that. So, yes, I, I think that there has been a change in approach. I think that we will see in the coming years if there's been a change in approach on the player development side. Um, the, the results will be how the major league team looks with homegrown talent in five years. That, that they'll speak for themselves. So, right on. Yeah, Brian, this is you've been giving us a ton of awesome information about uh, you know all the players and stuff like that. The one thing I, I wanted to ask you about 
uh, more in a personal side because, you know, Roger and I, we love baseball. We talk about baseball. We watch baseball. But you actually work in baseball. And I'm just kind of curious. Uh, you know, I even remember a couple years ago, I think you were on Twitter trying to figure out if you should take this job or not. And I'm just kind of curious what, what your experiences have been now that you've been doing this for a while and, and what your daily life is like. <laughs> well, it it, uh, well, it kind of depends on the time of year, really. Um, in January, I'll wake up and write all day because we'll be doing a lot of preview type content. You know, I, won't, I might not leave the house. But from uh, – and there, it's interspersed. Like, obviously, we're busy in the spring, but I'm not on the road constantly in the spring. But from May through, you know, the end of October, I'm gone, basically. I'm pretty much gone, whether it's, uh, you know, different events spread out over the country, whether it's events put on by us or put on by Major League Baseball or, or whatever it is. Uh, I'm gone somewhere watching baseball. I'm gone somewhere trying to find players. I'm gone somewhere trying to get updated looks at guys we've already seen. I'm gone somewhere trying to find a guy that is a really good player that we can potentially get to a big time event in the next year because he's an underclassman or something like that. Um, you know, we hold showcases and tournaments all over the country. And, and obviously we, we take pride in the fact that we have e extremely capable scouts who can evaluate these guys. And, and so therefore one of us at least is at all of these events throughout the country. Um, but yeah, it, it's a lot of, I, I don't know. I don't know if you would say that I, I have a similar job to an area scout because I don't. I go all over the country. But at the same time, I'm not, I don't have the same job as a national cross-checker because I'm not going somewhere to watch one guy play. Um, so it's, it's a lot of time on the road. It's a lot of time in hotels. It's a lot of time in airplanes. But I could not possibly imagine myself doing anything else in life. And I'm very, very grateful to Perfect Game for giving me a chance three, four years ago. And then... then blossoming into my role that I'm in now and, and uh, really just very grateful very grateful to work in baseball that's awesome Brian I'm happy for you yeah I was just say you can say the, the enthusiasm shows and it's uh especially with all the traveling you know, say it's like uh there's one song by the police called man in a suitcase so essentially you're just you, you get a routine and like I've done that before where I've traveled what was it I traveled 5,000 miles in the span of like a, a month and a half so I Totally get it, and uh, you can find Brian at Brian underscore B underscore Zakowski underscore PG, and you also can find him coming up in the spring, being a hitters and catchings coach over at Orchard Lake St. Mary's. This team is kind of fitting uh, for the Eaglets, so uh, good A and B school there. And uh, also, you can find him. Hopefully, maybe uh, he's a proud Gabriel Richard alumni. So kudos to you for being a pioneer. Um, we are GR. I, I, I we are that. GR. Yes. <laughs> it might be, you know what, for whatever reason, it drove me nuts because every time I saw it, it, it was like the, the Ohio state. So I always associated that. <laughs> we are GR. I'm like, Oh, and it, could be, it took Karini 10 years to we get are Penn state. Sicker. Yeah. <laughs> we are Penn state there. Yeah, there you go. So yeah, you can find them on Twitter. Uh, check out the website, perfectgame.org If you are just getting into baseball, great information. You can find his resources and uh, really good Twitter follow as well. So, Brian, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Appreciate you guys having me on. I had a lot of fun. That was, that was fun. And uh, we'll be back next week. We'll be doing – we'll bring it on the postseason. Chris and I will be doing our uh, ALCS and NLCS previews. So stay tuned for that.